two things. So my name is Morgan Ashcombe. I'm co-director of Visible Records with Kendall King. And uh, Visible Records is an artist-run space. There are studios, there's a gallery, um, and we provide a community space for artists and organizers in town to meet. Uh, we're also home to F12 Info Shop, which is a zine and bookstore. Um, there's two of Jackie's books over there, front and center. Um, so uh, if you're interested in purchasing anything from F12, there's a QR code there on the staircase uh, for Venmo. Um, Toby will appreciate it. Uh, so um, the exhibition that we have up in the gallery is, uh, this is the place. The artists are Javori Warren and Megan Richards. Uh, it'll be up through October 1st. And they are uh, Freeman residents all through last year. Um, the Freeman residency is a, a Residency that's geared towards BIPOC and LGBTQ plus artists that are coming out of UVA. They get a um, they get a studio uh, for a year. They get a stipend to pay for materials, and they get a two person show in the gallery at the end of the residency. Um, the other thing is, I just want to put on everybody's radar: September twenty first, uh, we're going to be having. A, uh, a prisoner letter writing uh, event here. There's going to be food, um, there's going to be tea. And <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so we'll start that off uh, and it'll become more obvious about why we're programming all that uh, as Jackie digs, it, digs into her work. Um, so uh, Jackie thankfully asked me not to just like read her Wikipedia <laughs> in the intro. So I'm just gonna say a few things about like how, what it is meant to have the Solitary Gardens project here uh, on this site. And so there's four Solitary Gardens that were installed in the summer of last year. Uh, they're on the back side of the warehouse uh, in between two community gardens called Common Field. And, um, one of the curators for Visible Records, Kate Fowler, um, had known of your work and was like, if you all have land, you've got to install these, these gardens and you've got to like, start this, this process. And I think that it's um, a really moving project. I won't dig into too many of the details, but I, I have seen personally how having these things here has built community and connection around ab prison abolition, around uh, connections between people in our community and people who are incarcerated. And I also think that it's really significant that they are here on this property because that right up there is Monticello. And that's like the connection of uh, chattel slavery to the modern, modern carceral state uh, is drawn into much sharper relief. Um, but that all of that is made possible because of how thoughtful Jackie has been about uh, the work that she does, and uh, it just means a great deal to me to, to have that work here, and um, is a core part, I think, of the identity of this place. So, um, thank you, and please join me in welcoming Jackie Snell. to imagine building or doing or going. Um, and the way that you guys not only cared for me, but continued this project was tremendous, yeah, and beautiful. And I think, you know, as we use art as a catalyst 
for not only creating a landscape without prisons, but building community around that. Um, I, I feel like this collaboration has really stood the test, the ultimate test. So thank you to you and Kim in particular, and to Matt and everyone else who has participated. And everyone who's here. Yeah, yeah, it's nice to see so many familiar and less familiar faces and a lot of folks from the studios here. Um, whoever is not lifting the seat in the shared bathrooms when they number one, could you stop doing that? <laughs> Just lift it. Thanks so much. Um, do I have to use that bathroom all day? Okay. Um, change of subject. So continuing to organize on the trajectory of gratitude, these are my elders. And it's important that I talk about my work in the context of this relationship. So these are three uh, incredible human beings, human doings. Um, Herman Wallace, Albert Woodfox. Herman Wallace, your left. Woodfox on your right, and Robert King in the middle, collectively known as the Angle of Three. So these are, are my elders, and without whom I would not have the uh, incredible opportunity to be standing before you today or do this kind of work. All of my personal and political orientation is because of their great tutelage, their patience, and their love. Um, they are collectively known as the Angola Three because they spent decades in solitary confinement and isolation in a prison called Angola in a state called Louisiana where I, I currently live. Um, I moved there in 2005 um, to do some work uh, in uh, about a week after Katrina, but I had been visiting them since 2001 when King came home. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I live in Louisiana uh, because of these men. And for those of you who don't know the history of Angola, just a little brief context. Um, Angola prison is the largest prison in the colonized United States, 18,000 acres of what they call a former slave plantation. Um, that is on the Chitimacha and unceded territory of Chitimacha and Choctaw, um, up the Mississippi River. Um, Louisiana, or the land we call Louisiana, was uh, made profitable and, um, and fat literally and figuratively through the forced labor practices of chattel slavery, predominantly uh, sugarcane, which was the bloodiest of all the chattel crops. So the initial colonizer of these 18,000 acres was a man named um, Isaac Franklin, who recognized that instead of forcing folks to travel down the, the tumultuous Mississippi, down to the slave port of Nouvelle Lyon, that he could just create a plantation that repopulated those sugarcane fields. So it was actually a Chattel breeding plantation um, in its initial imagination. He eventually sold, um, or that family eventually sold it to the state of Louisiana in 1901, where, you know, after a series of hoops, it became the Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola, or collectively known as Angola. Um, today, 2022, and Kelly, go ahead, correct me if I get any of these stats wrong, <laughs> there's um, about 6,000 able-bodied um, incarcerated people in Angola. Every able-bodied person is forced to work that those same 18,000 acres for two to 20 cents an hour, right? So maintaining the same economic paradigm of chattel slavery. Um, you know, I think um, when I was introduced to this work in 2001, it was like pre-Michelle Alexander's New Jim Crow and pre this national conversation um, around a mass incarceration, what we're calling mass incarceration. So I was completely blind to all of this stuff. And that's a really important context, because I might say a lot or drop a lot, or at very, very rare occasions sound interesting or smart. <laughs> and you know, all of that literally comes because Herman Albert and Robert were so fucking patient with me, right? And so willing to like meet me where I was at. And so the lens through which I share this information is really just as much as I could get out of my own way and share with you what they shared with me. Um, I'll talk a lot about isolation, extreme isolation, solitary confinement, because Herman spent 41 years in a six by nine foot cell, a minimum of 23 hours a day. Wood Fox spent 44 years, and King spent 29 um, <clears throat> in Angola. So in Angola, it's called CCR, closed cell restrictions. 
one of the reasons why it's so hard to eradicate the cruel and unusual practices of solitary confinement is because they mask it under so many different names, right? Sometimes it's ADSEG, the hold, the shoe, um, CCR, whatever it might be. But this presentation, or talking about my work, um, which ultimately my work is my way of saying thank you to these men, um, and the last 20 years of my life is really um, organized around questioning our complicity in these systems of punishment and control, right? And really questioning our immediate and combined relationships to punishment, the way that we are policing ourselves, policing our communities, and the way that we are creating a, a language around uh, ethos, around punishment that allows for um, uh, someone to spend 44 years in isolation, for that to be not only written into our constitutions, but our consciousness, yeah. And most of my answers came from this unlikely friendship. This is um, my cater cousin, Herman, um, who again spent 41 years in isolation. This is one of the visits actually in Hunt. Um, and you can see that Herman is still incarcerated there because uh, he's got shackles. Um, Herman Albert and Robert were Black Panthers and political prisoners. I think that's part of the context of why they were so grossly targeted. Um, but I had the great honor and privilege of collaborating with Herman for about 12 years on a project called The House That Herman Built, where he dreamed his, uh, his dream home from within isolation. And in doing so, he not only transcended, but ascended and alchemized the most extreme conditions of, of torture. Um, I won't spend that much time on it because the internet has, um, but this exhibition, The House That Herman Built, um, has traveled the world and became a really powerful catalyst um, to draw attention to uh, human beings that were literally buried inside our carceral institutions because of their tremendous power and imagination, right? Because of their ability to affect change. Herman used to say, the deeper you bury me, the louder my voice becomes, right? Um, and so in this exhibition, uh, Her Herman, or uh, sorry, uh, Herman's dream home was juxtaposed to his reality. So he was building his cell, that six foot by nine foot cell, again and again and again, and then as an artist, as a visual thinker, just placing it next to the different ways that he dreamt of the home that he might someday live in. And a lot of those designs came from letter writings, uh, letters uh, that we exchanged, of course phone calls and visits to the prison. Um, and, you know, like I said, I live in Louisiana because of these relationships. But the letter writing became really critical in informing the practices of the solitary gardens. Um, and, and it became this kind of like all but forgotten um, language. Like we're so quick to be like, boop, boop, I'm feeling this right now. Let me post about it or text you, you know? And like the thoughtfulness and intentionality that goes into letter writing actually for me is is the heart of these projects, the way that we document our love for each other and for the world. Um, as many of you know, uh, on October 1st, 2013, Herman's conviction was overturned, um, and he came home. Um, he joined the ancestors three days later, October 4th, 2013, from the late stages of liver cancer. And this is the part of uh, the conversation where I see all the shaking heads and I ask you to hold these two opposing truths at the same time as a practice of abolition. Herman Wallace died free, surrounded by those of us who loved him most, innocent in the eyes of the law, right? Next to the tragedy that Herman Wallace died uh, three days after his physical freedom from Angola. Those two things coexist at the same time. So when we ask folks to exercise the muscles of abolition, very often, I'm not relying on some kind of fucking it, I should tell you, I curse a lot. <laughs> There's gonna be a lot of F-bombs. Um, to hold true that folks commit harm, right? I don't rely on the practices or identities of innocence in order to have <coughs> compassion or love for human beings who are forced in these death camps, right? And that the complexity of the human being is, is, is uh, a known truth, all of us. Right? All of us are complex beings. And so how do we, as abolitionists, or abolitionist curious, or abolitionists by proximity, folks, how do we expand our ability to see and to hold those complexities at the same time? Yeah. So um, when I asked Herman what kind of house 
he dreams of. Um, he said, the first thing he said was, I don't dream about no house. I'm going to be a revolutionary. I'm a revolutionary. When I come home, I'm going to be on the hills of Mexico fighting with the people, for the people. And I was like, that's so dope. You're 61. You know, like, maybe just like a place to retire. You know? And so he was like, all right. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll play. Literally. You know, like, I'll do this for you. Let's explore. And then what happened, this is 2001, right? And so, like, 2001, we're breaking out into all of these uh, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and all. Oh, this, this seems like, you know, the entire universe is falling apart. And suddenly, you know, people are willing to listen to me talk about this man because I'm describing his, you know, uh, mirrored ceilings or shack carpets or all of the things that he's detailing in his house. And so Herman started to realize that this project became um, a really powerful catalyst to draw awareness around his situation. Like prior to that, you know, he's on his 29th year of isolation. At that point in my life, I was 28 years old, right? And so we have this parallel together where, you know, all of my life that man has been forced in a six foot by nine foot cell, concrete and steel, a minimum of 23 hours a day, you know? And here he is dreaming about his house. Um, and, and, and the second thing he asked for, so you know, he was like, all right, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. And the next letter came back and he said, all right, I can clearly see the gardens and they will be full of vaccinias, delphiniums, and roses. And I wish for guests to be able to smile and walk through gardens all year round. And the second thing he asked for was a swimming pool with a light green bottom and a large black counter. He had it right. Yeah. Um, so when Herman passed in 2013, you know, like I said multiple times, hey y'all, I, um, I, I was uh, uh, grieving tremendously and totally disoriented. Like this wasn't the house that Herman and Jackie built, right? This is the house that Herman built. And I'm, now I'm living in fucking Louisiana. Um, what am I supposed to do? You know, how do I move forward? And so I went back and I had thousands, literally thousands of letters that I could go back and read with, you know, these disoriented new eyes. And I realized how much Herman actually talked about plants and flowers. Um, he used to make me these gorgeous paper flowers that he would spend 12 to 23 hours just hand making. You know, for him, you know, he, he in this quote, or the first thing he asked for being the gardens, and he would, he asked for the house to be made out of wood um, because wood is alive, un unlike concrete and steel, right? And it keeps humans alive. And then also, if there's ever a raid by the FBI, you could burn it down and escape through an underground <laughs> tunnel. Um, yeah, this deep imagination. Um, there's some chairs here and here, and then if y'all want to sit, there's um, like some creepy fan seats and some stairs. Yeah. If you want to stand, that's totally cool. So the solitary gardens were actually birthed out of the intention of upholding the life and legacy of Herman Wallace while continuing to illustrate the inhumanity of solitary confinement. This was my way of continuing Herman's house. Um, and so there are principles on the tenets of um, prison abolition, permaculture, and art as a means to facilitate these often unexpected exchanges to transcend the architecture physically and energetically of carceral institutions, death camps in the colonized United States. Um, and so the gardens are built um, through the, that same practice of letter writing, predominantly between um, folks under, um, under minor uh, carceral watch like us, and exhibiting, existing in the free world and folks who are still incarcerated. And each one of these six foot by nine foot garden beds maintains that same blueprint. So what's outlined is the bed, the desk, um, the bench, and the toilet sink. And the only place where folks can grow is where the human being could physically move. So the negative space of the cell. The fronts of the cells have been built in many different ways. Um, but they become trellises, and the first iteration of them, they were built out of wood with the intention that we could see these prison cells turn garden beds um, disappear over time, you know, be overcome by the natural world and eventually disappear, proving that um, nature, like love, hope, um, compassion, kindness, will triumph over the harm that we collectively as humans 
have imposed on the planet. I think of it in the same way, like we have those really unexpectedly racist or sexist or ableist thoughts in our subconscious, right? Our thinking self hopefully doesn't want to be thinking that. But then our subconscious self maybe, Herman used to say, you can't be dipped in shit and not come out stinking, right? We live in the colonized United States. And so this idea that we are constantly being dipped in shit, our subconscious thoughts are often racist, sexist, misogynistic, adjacent, right? Ableist adjacent, against our own wishes. And so the, my thinking was like, how do you play on that? Well, you disappear these prison cells, and somewhere that same uh, 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 part of the brain that, that um, doesn't think to think, right, will imagine, will know that it's possible, that it is impossible to disappear prison. I mean, it is possible to disappear prisons. It is possible to exist on a landscape without them. Um, through that, again, social practice and all but forgotten existence of letter writing and sharing photographs and almanacs and exchanges, we literally are just translating prisoners' imaginations into the ground, growing the plants and the vegetables and the herbs of their choosing. Um, the natural materials of the original solitary gardens are really critical to storytelling. So the garden beds that are in Louisiana um, and the ones that I took on tour in 2019 are made out of sugarcane cotton and tobacco that I'm growing on site. So taking the largest chattel crops and then grinding them down and transforming them um, into these prison cells turn garden beds with the intention of illustrating that evolution of chattel slavery into mass incarceration that we talked about in the very beginning. So we're adding this natural uh, mortar and uh, natural lime that becomes a mortar maintaining that blueprint of the solitary cell, and they change over time. Um, and it becomes this collective practice where folks who maybe, you know, find it intimidating or scary, which is very real, or they're embarrassed about their own ignorance, or they've never, ever talked about um, PIC abolition, prison industrial complex abolition, or what the word abolition means, or maybe, you know, living in Louisiana in this little teeny tiny blue dot with these like proximal dashes of purple and a whole lot of red, you know? Like more people voted for Donald Trump in, in, per capita in the state of Louisiana than anywhere else. And so like to be able to have these outward facing conversations can be challenging, right? And that's a work, that's a work. You know, when the person who drops off the soil has a like Trump 2024 sticker on the back of his truck, the goal is to be, be, be able to engage him and these Garden beds have been just that, you know? To that point, you know, um, I've gotten a lot of free soil because <laughs> his brother was incarcerated, you know? And, and we can find this common line in spaces like this that we might not be able to find, you know, on the pickets, picket lines or in the streets in the same way. So it's been a, a really important organizing process for me. And so most of y'all, maybe know them um, through the work here, the visible records, and you can go check them out. Um, I love very much that you guys did this without me, you know, ultimately. That it was, you know, a couple of emails and conversations, and, you know, then you just took it and, and with your own vision and collaborative practices, and I think in that way they become a lot like little baby Herman's houses. But the relationships that are built around them and that transcend the prison walls and architecture are the most important outcome of this work. So yeah, varied journeys and interpretations. So um, the solitary gardens in New Orleans, you know, because they are made out of natural materials, they change over time um, as an abolitionist practice. So we started off with nine garden beds that were all in a line, like a cell block. Um, and as they change over time, we ask folks like, what is it that you'd like to see, you know, working with um, two women who are both incarcerated in the same institution in Texas, and they were like, oh, can we do each do one wing of a butterfly? So as the solitary garden was breaking down, the gardeners, the volunteers, changed the two garden beds into a butterfly, which is so beautiful, right? And it really begs this question, like, what happens if you invest in the possibility of change? Like, we're all changing over time. And you know, if you look at yourself like five, 10, 20 years ago, are you the same person? Fuck no, right? No matter how much Botox or like <laughs> shit you put in your face, you know? You're changing. And 
And if we use that as a principle for how to address harm in our communities, this idea that we can invest in the change, like I, I literally believe that folks can become butterflies. Like, you know, the idea of putting them in these partial institutions and condemning them to the worst mistake of their life does no good for those of us who are in the you know, semi-free world. Get that, Jackson. Um, so yeah. Um, you know, all the different ways that we can access these points of conversation feel really critical to the gardens themselves. And sometimes I'm just real fucking loud and direct. So this is the abolitionist sanctuary. Um, and the front of it says abolition for the people. This is also in New Orleans. And the idea of this space is similar to the solitary gardens. Actually, the very first solitary garden was built there. And it was a collaboration between the kids from the seventh ward where I live um, and Albert Wood Fox, who was on his 40th first year of isolation at the time. Um, but we just put this little pond in there. Y'all have to come see it when you come back. Um, and the idea is to create a sanctuary, literally in the seventh ward, where folks can gather um, and engage with the plants in many different ways. Um, so that actually is with Fox, um, and then my friend Mick. And so there's like QR codes that you could click on, and they'll take you to an online portal that, um, it sometimes uh, tells the stories of how these plants teach us about PIC abolition, how these plants ultimately teach us to be better people. Um, and so the hope for me is like, you know, to scale up, to use and employ emergent strategy and to be able to scale up and scale down very much in the same way, you know, that Wood Fox and King and Hooks met me, you know, like to be able to respond in the, with this fluidity um, which is also antithetical to the rigidity that systems of punishment and control rely on, right? Again, like in simple terms to meet people where they're at. Should I keep going? Should I talk? Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> did I throw these in here so we could like take a break? <laughs> telling Kara, sometimes I just like go and then I'm like, where am I? <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, so we have all these gardens across the country. You know, I spent 2019 driving around actually with someone who had just spent five years in isolation, five years on death row in uh, Angola, um, setting up these solitary gardens so that there's probably like 20 something around the country, maybe a little bit more. Um, I, I love finding out about them accidentally, like not, not knowing that people have built them. I was actually up in Hudson, in the Hudson Valley um, uh, recently, and somebody was like, oh, you have to go to blah, blah, blah community garden. They have a solitary garden there. I love that. It's like so special, and I think, you know, with the intention of upholding the life and legacy of Herman Wallace, that's the best way, right? That's the best way. So with all of these gardens um, and all this abundance, literally, of ideas, um, uh, ways of honoring and, and literal plants and plant medicine, this is actually Chopper's family. Chopper grew with us for six years before um, being released on parole and his solitary garden was part of his parole package, which is really beautiful. So his family, yeah, Ashe, his family came, um, his mom and his sister, and harvested from the gardens. Um, sometimes we share what we grow with the community directly around them, in New Orleans in particular. Y'all have your own ways of doing it. I saw some okra and some green beans back there. You know, like there's all different ways of sharing the abundance of these gardens. Um, and, as nature do, as nature do, we still have so much more stuff, right? So in the last couple of years, we've been creating an entire apothecary of plant medicine grown in collaboration and designed by folks who are still incarcerated. Um, and so folks on the outside are learning with folks inside, you know, through books, through, um, uh, I, sometimes I'll host workshops about the different um, plants, the history of the plants, the plant medicine, etc. Um, and then folks inside are then designing the plant medicine in the abolitionist apothecary. And I think it's super cool, because in this way, incarcerated individuals actually have a unique opportunity to heal communities they've often been accused of harming, you know? Really transcending, like the American perceptions of criminality and restitution, this like false dichotomy um, and redemption. And so this is what I've taken on tour, is this project. Um, offering healing justice workshops uh, that talk about the important connections between PIC abolition and plant medicine. Um, so 
So this is growing and growing and growing with our gardens. And so, you know, that idea of scaling up and scaling down, some of it exists as little teeny tiny medicine bottles or a tea. Um, and we just opened the John Thompson Legacy Center, which is actually home to the abolitionist apothecary. Um, and the JTLC, you maybe can see the similar visuals between the sanctuary gates and the front. So John Thompson, for those of you who don't know, it was more of a homie than an elder. Uh, I don't, I'm sure you could attest to this. Um, we definitely, we were like family, you know, and JT spent 14 years on death row, eight days of execution before being exonerated and coming home shortly after King. So I think JT came home in 2003, King came home in 2001, yeah. Um, and one of the benefactors of the Innocence Project, which was you know the catalyst that brought him home, gave him the space, 1212 St. Bernard, where he started Ray, Resurrection After Exoneration. JT passed in the space in 2017. Um, he had a heart attack. And um, since then, his widow, myself, and several other folks from the community have been like really trying to get it started. And so, is there anyone from the Ford Foundation or Art for Justice here? <laughs> so I took all my money from the Ford Foundation and I funneled it into opening the JTLC. And that was a totally different project. And so we were able to um, reopen the space after so many years of it being shut down. And the other like massive catalyst that kickstarted this opening was Hurricane Ida. And so, like this space in JT, in the wake of JT's le like legacy, became the heart of food, gas, water, distro in the seventh ward. Um, and in the back, we built this dope ass um, sounding board and greenhouse where we could grow. Yeah, it's beautiful, right? It's tight. And so, um, and so we're literally seeding abolitionist ideas and values, right? Literally growing plants that then our community can take home and heal themselves. And it looks really sexy at night. <laughs> Doesn't it? Yeah. Someone just interviewed me and they were like, could you distill your work down to just one sentence? And I was like, I could do better than that. I think I could do it in two words. And he was like, what is it? And I was like, seduce and destroy. <laughs> medicine gets um, redistributed back into communities, often those in, you know, in New Orleans, um, especially in the seventh ward where I live. Uh, there, one out of four households are directly impacted by mass incarceration. One out of four households have a beloved inside, which is fucking nuts, right? And it's completely normalized in the city of New Orleans. New Orleans uh, incarcerates more people per capita than any place in the colonized United States. We know the colonized United States loves punishment and incarceration, and incarcerates more people than any place in the world, right? So just like some context. And so this medicine is then offered back out to our community through these mutual aid actions. They also like in the wake of the uprisings and the California fires and whatnot, we're putting together these packages of plant medicine that is grown and designed in collaboration with folks who are incarcerated. That's beautiful, yeah. This is just some of the letters um, of folks telling us what we should grow. This is actually from Chopper. Chopper said, like, if he had access to this, this is Passiflora incarnata, made pop. And if he had access to uh, this kind of plant knowledge and plant medicine, he may not have found himself incarcerated because it helps to prevent DDTs um, and withdrawal symptoms from addiction. Um, so one of the ways that we offer this plant medicine out is through the apothecarts, which I think are really beautiful. Um, yeah, so um, this was designed in collaboration with some young folks at Tulane University. And so the apothecarts carts are able to just, um, again, applying the emergence strategies, um, bike around the town, and then um, trained community herbalists will offer that plant medicine out, really looking at um, ideas of healthcare sovereignty, um, mutual aid, and abolition. And then um, I am on tour with another version of this, Scaling Up, which is the abolitionist tea party, um, where I'm driving around in this crazy van um, that I designed. And you know, the first leg of the trip was um, with my sister, Natalie, um, who did land acknowledgments at the beginning, indigenous Colombian woman. And then we have these um, outward facing conversations about the, the ways that 
local plants predominantly are plants that are often considered weeds um, or unwanted, very similar to the way we treat our incarcerated or formerly incarcerated people. Um, how they endorse abolition as a strategy, not only for survival, but for joy and liberation. Yeah. And there's just some pics of the workshops. Um, I uh, grew up in the 1900s, probably not a big surprise, <laughs> but um, uh, I also grew up at a time where the transformers were kind of central to my identity, and so the van is designed in that way. Like I think of it as like my Optimus Prime um, vehicle. It's cool, yeah. At a certain point, you're like, I don't want to sleep in a van anymore, but it's pretty nice, yeah. Um, this is actually in Burlington. So the tour took off, um, started off at PS1 MoMA in New York, and then rocked up through um, upstate New York, and then Burlington, and this is the Burlington thing, and they did this really amazing, um, they re organized this really beautiful tea party that had pizza. Um, gluten-free pizza at the end, and I was like, that is uh, abolition right there. Um, and then we went up to Montreal, and then back down, and then sort of landed here. And so on Wednesday, Morgan mentioned, we'll have a, a tea party and a, a letter writing event with pizza. Is that true? Okay. <laughs> um, should I do one more project? Yeah. Just one more? You're not the only one here. I just gotta see it. <laughs> I'll finish with this project, which is <clears throat> aforementioned um, at the courtyard at PS1. Have you all ever been to PS1 in New York? Um, it has this really amazing radical history, um, which has been completely colonized. Is anyone from PS1 here? <laughs> there we go. Um, MoMA bought it. It was like really struggling to stay open um, in, you know, in an imperialist capitalist heteropatriarchy. And so MoMA bought it. And so now it's MoMA PS1. Um, and they uh, built these really intense walls around what was a, a public space. And those really intense walls for any of us who have been inside a carceral institution look a lot like um, a prison yard. And so they asked me um, to use this greenhouse. Now, just a little context, and I'll come back to the walls. This greenhouse, one of our solitary gardeners, Jesse, um, has been gardening for seven years with us. And Jesse is incarcerated at ADX. Do we know ADX? Just a sh shake your head yes if you've heard of it. And no if you haven't. Okay, great. Um, so ADX is the federal penitentiary in Florence, Colorado. It's like one of the prisons that they call a supermax. Um, it is explicitly designed to torture human beings. That's it. There is, there is no identity of healing or redemption inside the prison itself. 80% of it is underground. Um, so there's no natural circadian rhythms, no sunrise, no sunset. The COs, the correctional officers, as well as the folks who are incarcerated there, are, are literally losing their minds. Um, and so Jesse was there for seven years. He came out of parchment in Mississippi and was transferred to ADX. Um, and heard about this crazy project where folks grow gardens on behalf of incarcerated folks in solitary confinement. And so um, he, uh, it, it became a lifeline for Jesse in literal and figurative terms. Um, a lot of prison watchdogs consider ADX the worst prison in America because of the conditions that I described. But, you know, I talked about Herman Albert and Robert's experience, um, and, and, and there are just three of 100,000 men, women, and children um, that are kept in isolation, extreme isolation, at any given moment in our collective histories. But that day, 23 in one is the way they were. 23 out of 24 hours, they're in the cell. Or Herman used to say, minimum of 23 hours a day. In ADX, it's 24 and zero, right? So folks are inside the cell. There's actually a shower. Um, I don't know if I, I took that slide out. The, the cells are nine by 11, um, and they are, and the shower is in there on a timer, and then there's a bed and a desk and a little stool. Um, and then there's a double gate. So there's a gate at the front and a gate in the back. There's literally no human contact in, until you're being cuffed 
for an occasional visit or, um, or a trip to the medical uh, office. And so um, I built, this is the slide I wanna go to, I built this greenhouse um, based on the drawings that Jesse um, shared with me about his experience being in ADX. And the idea was to make something that is varied from our sight and our consciousness and make it transparent. And the original design of the greenhouse had the bed, the shower, the desk, all of those components in it. And then it had the double set of gates at the front. And then I brought it to PS1 and I was like, no, this looks like a fucking prison yard and it's gonna trigger someone who's been incarcerated um, to have to be exposed to this. You know, I don't know that there's enough warning that can happen. And so for this exhibition, we redesigned it such that it just operates um, as a greenhouse, literally growing plants inside of it. Um, and then we took out those ar uh, architectural elements of the isolation cell, including the gates at the front. So it's kind of like a fake Dan Graham, you can see here. Um, and so this is a two year project that I've been working on with the Lower East Side Girls Club. So if, if it hasn't been named explicitly, my work is really organized around social practice. And so the Lower East Side Girls Club um, and myself, have, it's called Growing Abolition. So through uh, the two years of programming where we're literally um, growing these gardens, growing ideas around PIC abolition and then contributing plant medicine to the apothecary, we've created this um, really massive exhibition that will live in what you're looking at now, which is homeroom at PS1. Um, that you could see the little Vigo garden beds around there. Each one of those is a community partner that's already doing this dope work in New York. And so some of it, it is re-entry work, some of it is working directly with folks who are inside, um, some of it is taking down Rikers, some of it is you saw Viva from Thank God for Abortion. It's like folks that are doing amazing work. So we're growing these little baby gardens as snapshots of that work. And then what we're growing in the greenhouse goes to the gardens that they have literally outside of PS1. And so following the laws of nature, this is a loofah that I brought there, um, as an ethos really, as a practice um, and a source for solutions for the the crises that we have collectively created, whether or not it is you know, the climate crisis or mass incarceration or environmental racism, sexism, et cetera, um, you know, inform, the solutions are informed by the plants themselves. And that feels really important to me to highlight is that I have learned so much in growing, you know, um, moving at the speed that the plants themselves um, demand and then sharing that with you know the next generation um, and uh, you know and sharing how much plants teach us about possibility um, growth abolition and liberation that's madison my mini me um, she was the intern for um for this project over the course of two years and what i think is so special here is you could see that lufa taught us how to escape Right? Taught us how to get out of the architecture of prison. You know, what looked like um, the yard at a prison. The Lufo was like, Psh, no problem, I'm out, you know? And so we have so much to learn from, from the natural world, but we have to be willing to listen, right? It's like a, a massive undertaking to decolonize our relationship to plants. Like, this is mine, I grew it, I could just eat it, you know, I could just take it, I could just do this. This flower's pretty, I'm gonna cut it, you know? and to like really reorganize our thoughts and be able to listen. Um, and so my time here is processing all of this um, work. I am creating this um, big, this will be a mural inside the homeroom space for the exhibition that opens in November um, with collages of photos from the last two plus years. Um, I'm doing a lot of hiking and then I'm just gonna finish here. I really want to go caving and spelunking. So if there's anyone here that's into that, I love it. Um, like going through portals in, in the belly of the earth. Um, and so I'm hoping to do some of that there. This is my advertisement if anyone <laughs> does that kind of stuff. Call me, I don't know. <laughs> Find me afterwards. <laughs> um, 
and then, you know, I kind of rock through these things. Like I said, sometimes a little bit too fast or I might not hit the points that you needed to hear. So you can always just shoot me an email or slide into my DMs, whatever is comfortable, if you have any questions. Um, and I would love to finish with a little prayer, a little offering um, as, a, as a way to sum it up and honor my elders, if y'all are willing. Just take your feet, if you can, place them on the ground. One of my homies, Jabron Rivera, says, you know, when you breathe in, you inspire. When you breathe out, you respire. And so when you do this together, you conspire. So if we can just take in a nice big inhale, I'm totally outing myself with my woo-woo right now. I take in a nice big inhale and then reach the top, we'll hold it together. Pause. And then exhale. And then again like that, breathe in nice and deep, nice and big, and hold on to it at the top. And then exhale. And then last one. So breathing in deeply, breathing in fully, holding at the top and maybe just seeing how uncomfortable that might feel, this sense of grasping, of holding on. And then exhale, let that go, that relief. Yeah. And then an offering, may this practice, may the work that we do together, the time that we share, help us to co-create a world where all beings have equal access to land, red, water, housing, education, healthcare, control of technology, an end to police brutality, an end to all forms of oppression, a world where all beings have the right to choose their own destiny, are seen equal in the eyes of the law, in the hearts and minds of each other. Thank you so much. How did I initially get in contact with folks in solitary? This is a funny story. Um, I was living in San Francisco, and I was in grad school at this place called Stanford. And it was literally the first time my parents were like, yeah, that's my daughter, you know? Like, I was just like really on this intense path. And through that, um, through Stanford, I actually met someone, this organizer that I had a crush on. And, and they were like, yo, there's this person coming to uh, the luggage store gallery in San Francisco who just spent 29 years in solitary confinement in a prison called Angola in a state called Louisiana for a crime he couldn't have possibly committed. Do you want to go? And all I heard was, do you want to go? <laughs> and I was like, if you've ever been to San Francisco, I, was, I had a bike. And so I was like biking. I was a like, super jock as a kid. And I was like biking. And um, this SUV cut me off. And I like threw my bike down, pulled out my earrings. and was like, fuck you, you gas guzzling motherfucker. Like screaming at this dude that may or may not have seen me, you know? And then I like reapplied my makeup and walked up the stairs of the luggage store gallery. And then I sat in front of this person who had just spent 29 years longer than I had been alive in a six by nine cell, a minimum of 23 hours a day for a crime he couldn't have possibly committed. And he wasn't angry. And I was like, shit. <laughs> I got something to learn from you, you know? I almost threw down with this total stranger who may or may not have seen me, right? Like I just was like filled with angst and rage all the time. And then, you know, there was Robert King who was like, found a way to alchemize and transmute. And you know, it was just a real intuition that I was like, oh, I do have to learn from you. And so, you know, King said, does anyone have any questions? He just came home, like this was April, he came home in February. And he was like, does anyone have any questions? And I was like, everybody, it was like a, a maybe maybe 10 people in the room. And everyone was just like made silent by this reality. 2001, you know? And I was like, what what can we do? Like, I'm just a student. Like, look. And he's like, write my comrades. Write Herman, write Albert. Let the prison know that you know they're alive. And I was like, those, those are direct orders. Absolutely, you know? And so I just started writing Herman and Albert and changed the rest of my life. Yeah. Sorry, I'm getting emotional. Woodbox just passed on August 4th, 
of this year, you know. And like really, I have had a life of utter magnificence. Like to be in the presence of these men who have done so fucking much on behalf of the people, you know, because they believe in us, you know, because they love us beyond the worst of humanity. That is a gift, you know. Yeah. And so here I am. <laughs> How do you support yourself doing this? How do I support myself? Many ways. So, you know, I definitely have, have worked food and bev for a very long time and then hustled a bunch of side jobs. And then in 2013, I got my first fellowship from, the, from George Soros. You guys heard of it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I hadn't at the time. <laughs> Somebody else was like, you should apply for the Soros Fellowship. And, um, and I got it. And then, you know, from there, it just becomes a matter of um, just applying and reapplying, reworking grants. And then I, um, you know, I also teach off sometimes. So I have, I have like teaching fellowships that are one year or two years. No offense. I'm just not a huge fan of academia. And so it doesn't always. Like, I'm not looking for a 10-year track job, you know. I can't. I don't think that'll work. But, um, but I do believe that the idea of supporting myself is also a practice of supporting my community. And I'm always taking care of. Like, when Devante was killed, like, that, that's agony. It's the most agony I've ever been in in my life. And I hope no one ever feels that way, you know. And I was so taken care of. You know, I was so supported. So I, I just answered the question assuming you're asking me about capital, but like, I support myself by loving on others, you know? I support myself by taking care of my community. Like the folks that fucking rocked up and really like, Weekend at Bernie's, like made me brush my teeth, made me bathe myself, made me eat. Like, Woodfox, you know? Albert Woodfox was like, I got you, you know? <laughs> he, 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 he was one of the first folks there. That's amazing, right? That is testament to the way that we take care of each other. Yeah. I have a question. Um, Kelly and Thomas know that like I'm fueled by anger every day. <laughs>
Don't piss the garlic king. Wood fox, however, I've never pissed, I never pissed him off. <laughs> never. Really? In our 19, no, 20, 21 years of knowing each other, Herman and I pissed off all the time. <laughs>
and you feel it when you're in there, even with all this stupid lights. But I was like, I'm gonna try to find a cave that is not like, you know, lit with neon lights and shit. And I found one on the internet in Northern Alabama. Oh. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this for D-Man, you know, face my fear. And so, you know, it's a practice for us to, to do things that D-Man couldn't, right? Things we really wanna do, things we're scared to do, whatever, like, right? Travel with the kids, whatever. And so, um, and so I was like, all right, I'm on my own. I'm gonna do this, right? And so I drive to Northern Alabama, and I the person doesn't have like a proper like website or anything like that. Like you know, there's no like fact checking. There's some like reviews on Google, and there's like a Facebook page. I don't know how this. How I said yes. Like this is like remember when I said I had good community? This is where I question it. Like nobody oh. stopped me. You know? <laughs> and so I like rock up. Oh, this story is. I rock up and I'm like, okay, I'm here to go caving. And this enormous human being comes out, right? And he's got like a, a ponytail and he's very big and he looks like ex-military and he's got all these tattoos and I'm like looking for like a proud boy symbol. <laughs> you know, just like studying him, <laughs> sizing me up. And I'm like, oh God, what am I doing? And then he's like, have you ever done this before? And I'm like, well, I've been caving. He's like, well, have you been splunking or whatever? And I was like, no. And then he's like, okay, well, we're gonna do, you know, he had an American flag bandana, judging. <laughs> and then I was like, okay. He's like, it'll be like two and a half hours. And I was like, okay, yeah, max. Two, I got two and a half hours to do this, right? And so we get to the, it's his private land. Like he bought this land and found the cave and is trying to make it a theme park or something with like other shit that is like so bizarre. And so he's like, okay, you get to the cave, you hike up the mountain, get to the opening in the, of the cave and he crawls in and then he's like, so um, he's like, do you, are you afraid of snakes? Big puddle. 
just going to change it was deeply moved by Herman's house. I told him a little bit about it. And so I was like, let me, I'm going to get you a book. So I go to the van and I grab a book, I change, I grab a book and he comes over and we're just talking. And I was like, here, if you like the book, you know, and he's looking at me, he's like, what's this van? And I was like, oh, the abolitionist apothecary, you know, plant medicine, growing collaboration with folks who are incarcerated, like going on and on. <laughs> and then he looks at me like I just like insulted his head, like staring at me. Or like I was. Yeah. I just want to say thank you. I think it's incredibly beautiful. And um, I think for myself, I often am very jaded. So, like, short of having a near-death experience and, like, trauma bonding with uh, someone who might be, I'm just assuming he may have been skeptical of abolition, at least until he met him, but until, at least until he met you, what have you found to be, like, what, are, what is the most effective way to engage people who are opinionated 
like want to talk about that's like deeply skeptical of of the work of abolition and maybe from a place of misunderstanding it like how do you effectively engage folks yeah yeah did you guys hear that question so like when people are hardened and rigid in their belief systems it feels like a really good cue for me to also check myself mm. and like where am i hardened and rigid in my belief system and so you know i think it's really important to approach any conflict like big and small like we are humans we cause harm that is basically the you know the end all and be all of our own existence no matter how good we are no matter how many electric cars we drive like we just fucking cause harm right and so like to respond to harm with curiosity and to respond to it with wonder feels like the most important first step and so like when you have Papa so and so who wants to rock up to the White House when Obama is president with a gun. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like it becomes rather than well, this is this is why that's fucked up and racist. Rigid. It's sort of like, well, tell me more about that. Mm -hmm. It's like curiosity and wonder. And it doesn't mean that at the end, either one of you has like won, mm -hmm. but hopefully at the end, you found something in each other, like that essence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so hard, and you guys are, you're doomed. <laughs> no, on the real, yeah. lawyers are doomed. Yeah. Because your whole thing is about this binary system of win or lose, guilty or innocent, mm -hmm. you know? And that's not the reality of who we are. Like, how do, you, we're all guilty of something, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And like, how do we engage with that false binary and then create a full system on the side that allows for the complexity of harm, mm -hmm. yeah. It's so important, you know? Like Ruthie Gilmore talks about abolition, not just about destruction, but about creation, mm -hmm. right? And building these, co-creating these um, systems that will make the existing system obsolete, yeah. That, that was, I have a follow-up question about what do you think is like the biggest misconception that, we, that you run up against when people might already have preformed opinions about abolition? What is the biggest misconception? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I, I'm gonna reframe that, because I, I don't know if it's a misconception. I, I hate, I hate being wrong. <laughs> I hate it. Totally. Even about something stupid, you know? <laughs> like, the, that place has gluten-free stuff, and then it doesn't, and I'm like, well, I'm, I hate it. Like, I'll be like, oh no, they did last week. You know, <laughs> whatever. And, ugh, and like, I think, so I think what motivates us to, to create those conflicts and be, is like the fear of knowing, of finding out you're wrong. Yeah. You know, the fear of finding out that you've been lied to, you've been tricked, that mm -hmm. sucks. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you like, have ever been in a relationship with someone who was just like fucking lied to you, that kind of betrayal. So imagine your whole life, you're suddenly, you know, awakened to the reality that you've been lied to about what keeps you safe. Mm. You've been lied to about what justice is. Like, mm. I have compassion for that as someone who also has been lied to, you know? Yeah. And so I, I think that does help to engage those conversations and just not, not, you have to undo so much, right? So much of this work is about undoing. So you have to undo the way that you guys are, like your weapons of like, I'm gonna win. Mm -hmm. And that means you lose. And like, three, what? how do we like, restructure that so that we both uh, thrive, we both win. Yeah, that's fucking hard, but it's so important. Mm -hmm. Or you just go caving with them. <laughs> <laughs> trauma bonding. <laughs> <laughs> for him, there was no trauma. And for him, it, I mean, like, he just was like, this is where, he's like, he's just like, all of his love and all of his beauty is in there. Just covering up. Yeah, it's cool. No worries, no worries. Do y'all know that the bathroom is that way and now whoever's leaving the seat down when they're standing and urinating is now putting it up? Growth, so <laughs> progress. Yeah, progress, progress. Do y'all want to see the gardens? Can we walk out to the gardens? Yeah. I think that would be nice. Yeah, thank y'all so much. Woo!